very good afternoon to one and all present here. My name is Diva Lavani, a first year stu undergraduate student at Plain University, and I take immense pleasure in welcoming you all for this exclusive webinar on building psychological readiness for life amidst the metaverse. The pandemic accelerated the shift from offline to online a decade ago. Coinciding with the emergence of social platforms and mobile, mobile first enterprises. Today, we are on the cusp of the next technology, technology paradigm shift, the metaverse. The metaverse was primarily associated with the gaming industry. Recently, there has been some interest in its application in the workspace. New immersive forms of team collaboration, the emergence of new digital AI-enabled co-workers, and the acceleration of learning and skills acquisition through visualization and gamified technologies are significant ways in which the metaverse appears to reshape the world of work. As the metaverse looks set to transform the world of work, we must also advance to meet new opportunities, address challenges, and identify key psychological skills to be future ready. To, pre to prepare for this, we are here with our most awaited webinar series called Connections, a well-curated lecture series that helps our students discover the value of interdisciplinary thinking in today's demanding world. Today's session will be taken by Professor Saraj Patki, Faculty of Psychology, a PhD in Psychology from Savitri, Phule, Savitri Bhai Phule, Pune University. He has over 10 years of teaching experience, including undergraduate and postgraduate courses at various colleges in Pune. He teaches abnormal psychology and experimental psychology. He is a certified emotional intelligence trainer and has conducted numerous workshops for schools, colleges and organizations, including Reliance Industries, CID Office, Bajaj Auto, the Modern Institute of Business Management, MIT Shillong and the Pune People's Co-op Bank. Professor Patkis, Research interests include the psychological effects of social media and artificial intelligence, emotional intelligence, and organizational citizenship behavior. I am sure we are all going to have a very enriching session. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deva. A very warm welcome to all the participants who have joined us for this connection series. And um, yeah, as, as Deva said, I think, uh, you know, we have been talking about the metaverse. There are a lot of discussions about it across different platforms. Uh, unfortunately, most of the focus has been on the tech part of it. Uh, the focus has been on what kind of hardware or kind of software we're developing. Uh, we're looking about readiness in terms of the technology that's available, the internet speed that's available, different gadgets that are taking us into the metaverse. Um, and that's when I thought that we should also be discussing parallelly as to at a psychological level, how ready are we for this entire new world? Okay. Now, we, while we're calling it the entirely new world, uh, we have actually also started entering bits and pieces of the metaverse ever since the pandemic in different ways. Um, so if you look at uh, video conferencing, if you look at augmented reality, most of the gadgets that were shown in movies probably a decade ago are not uh, just prototypes anymore. Right? Uh, we are using these gadgets. They are part of our day-to-day -day life. Many of these aspects are becoming a part of our day-to-day -day life. But on the other hand, are we evolving at that same pace? Are we developing at that same pace? Are we getting ready for the metaverse in terms of a psychological readiness? So that's what we'll be discussing today. And yes, there will be a brief question and answer session at the end of the uh, the talk. But um, I wouldn't say that it's going to be your questions and my answers. Probably we'll all collaboratively come up with more questions that. Uh, would be answers not today, not tomorrow, maybe in the years to come. But at least us asking these questions helps us be ready for probably what's coming forward. Yeah. So we'll briefly discuss um, what does entering Metaverse look like. Um, I won't be going into the technical details about what exactly Metaverse is, uh, what kind of technological uh, background is needed for it. I'm sure uh, you all have some idea about it. Uh, before we get into it, right? So we'll be discussing about different kinds of jobs that are going to be uh, most probably prevalent in 2040. How do we prepare ourselves for it? What kind of psychological challenges would be there uh, when we're talking about the metaverse? And then how do we build our readiness for all of these challenges beginning from today, 
right? And as I said, towards the end, uh, we just have some exciting discussions, some questions raised, some solutions that we probably have found for ourselves. Um, I see that there are quite a few students in the audience, but also some counselors, teachers, parents as well, probably. So it would be interesting to see their perspective as well. And, um, you know, what, what kind of future do they envision for themselves, for their kids, uh, for their students, probably. And, you know, where is it that we are heading towards? Yeah. So before we start off, um, I would just like to have a quick poll launch to understand uh, what are your feelings, what are your sentiments about what Metaverse exactly is. Um, could we have the poll launched, please? Sure, sure, Professor. Yeah, so how do you feel about life in the Metaverse? Okay, in case there are multiple feelings, probably you could select the option that's the topmost, the most intense emotion, the most intense feeling that you have about the metaverse. Yeah. So as you can see the results on your screen, uh, there seems to be a combination of emotions, right? There are some people who are scared. A uh, majority of people seem to be both excited. There are some people on an equal percentage that are you know, talking about how metaverse could probably be a very lonely space, a very artificial space, right? So there are going to be mixed feelings about this entire scenario. And we are entering the, the entire unknown world of the metaverse, a very virtual augmented reality world with these kind of feelings, with these kind of sentiments. Yeah. Uh, so let, let's look into how these emotions are going to shape us and what exactly are we going to do with these feelings. Yeah. So when we talk about entering the metaverse, let's actually spend some time in a little time travel. Yeah. So when you registered for the session, probably the organizers did not tell you, but we're going to have a quick peep into 2040. Yeah. So have your seats belts on, just be ready for the G-forces that we are about to witness. If you have watched any sci-fi film about wormholes, about time travel, that's exactly what we are going to do. Yeah. So just close your eyes. Keep uh, you know anything that you have around you. Just keep it around. Just keep it away. Just relax. Close your eyes and try to imagine that we are entering this portal that's going to take us right now directly into 2040. Yeah. So close your eyes. Try to imagine you're entering this portal after all that buzzing, after all that excitement, after all that sound and energy that you feel around you, you finally enter 2040. Yeah. Now just think about how life in 2040 looks. What are the gadgets you're wearing? How does your house look? What does school and college look like? What do your workplaces look like? How do the roads look? What kind of vehicles do you see? What kind of modes of transportation do you see? What kind of social media platforms probably we would have by then? What kind of social relationships we would have? What kind of friends? What kind of family members we would have by then? Yeah, so any quick comments about how do you envision 2040? What does the world around you look like? Yeah, you could put it in the chat. What do you see around you? What kind of vehicles? What kind of workspaces? Electric cars, okay. Autonomous cars, autonomous vehicles, yeah. Do you see drone taxis as well? Skyscrapers, lots of screens. Okay, use of clean energy, yes, we hope for it. Party. Okay, unfortunately, yes, there could be some differences in terms of haves and haves nots. 
Okay, surrounded by a lot of machines. Renewable energy, hopefully, yes. Economic turmoil. Okay, machine dependence and loss of jobs. Yeah, robots everywhere. Yeah, great, great. No one visible, yeah. Possibly streets are empty, we're all at our home working, working remotely. A lot of disparity, yes. Okay, so I think again, you know, the same kind of sentiments that we started off the session with, there seems to be some gloomy aspects, there seem to be some negative gray areas, there seem to be certain positives about it, uh, there seems to be some excitement, some newer technology, all of this seems to be a lot more prevalent, right? So there would be some pros, there would be some cons, obviously, yeah. Yeah, sophisticated and high speed of life. Right. Okay. So just keep that thought in mind. Just have that visualization with you while we move towards the next few slides because I want you all to remain in that space, just kind of absorb the environment and understand what does it feel like to be living in 2040, right? It's it's not a far off time. Um, it seems like a couple of decades, but uh, we will soon reach there and um, you really have to be prepared for it from right now itself. Yeah. So just keep that thought in your mind and try to think about what would work look like, what would jobs look like, what kind of jobs would be there. Um, how would offices look like? Would you be traveling to office? If yes, what kind of transport would you have? Um, how would you be applying for jobs? How would job interviews take place? Right? So there are so many issues that we are going to be facing in this entire area of metaverse. We already are uh, you know, having virtual meetings and virtual conferences. We have avatars that uh, can be designed, can be you know, at a, multiple times we are uh, hosting multiple meetings and multiple engagements with people. So there's a lot that is going to happen in that sector as well. Right? So I've just curated a few jobs that are expected to be or you know zones and fields of area that are going to be quite prevalent in um, the next couple of decades right so robotics like we all said yes there'll be um, androids there'll be robots all over us so obviously it means that there'll be a huge job market in terms of designing them repairing them maintaining them grooming them in terms of becoming much more efficient so robotics is going to be one area that you can look forward to. Data, I mean, everybody has been talking about data as being the new fuel. Uh, I'm sure every time you open up your YouTube, there'll be some or the other ad that will pop up talking about data science, machine learning, AI, all of these, right? So the reason why there are so many courses, the reason why we are trying to build in this aspect is because yes, data is going to be one of the major areas where there will be a lot of job opportunities. So data curation, data management, data brokering, uh, safety related to data. So there'll be so many numerous jobs related to data data itself right uh, ai enhanced work so i'm sure some of you all must have heard in the news about uh, ai creating art ai creating music and there's a lot of discussion in the um, area of artists and creative endeavors wherein we are talking about will ai replace creativity right and that certainly doesn't seem to be the way we look forward to, but yes, definitely AI enhanced creativity could be one major zone in which we're looking at. So artists using AI to make them work, work more efficient, make it more effective, connect better with people. Um, you could look at movies being made using AI, you're looking at music being created using AI, artwork being created, dance being created using AI, right? So a lot of AI enhanced work is something that we could have people generally coming from an arts uh, perspective, from a creative perspective, but using AI to enhance their work. Drones, as we spoke about, um, that's again one area in which we uh, see a lot of progress already happening, not just globally, but also in the country. Yes, currently we're looking at the 
kind of destructive aspects and applications of drones, but we are looking at drones for agriculture, we are looking at drones for um, delivery, we are looking at drones for supplying medicines, which already happened during COVID as well. You could look at drones for surveillance and for mapping. So a lot of uh, applications will come up for drones as well, right? How are we preparing for this? Uh, well, personally, I got myself a drone license. So I am DJCA certified when it comes to being a drone pilot. Um, obviously, that was not out of job insecurity or something of that sort. That was my own passion for photography. But looking forward, I suddenly realized that, yes, if I have this confidence of flying a drone, possibly there are different applications that we might think of 10 years down the line that could be linked to the era of education as well. Right. Personal health. Now, this is again one area that, uh, you know, when we spoke about what you feel about 2040, what do you feel about the metaverse? We spoke about feeling lonely. We spoke about being a little scared about it. There'll be a lot of health related issues that we might come across, both physical health, psychological health. And for that reason, personal health related um, expertise in terms of genetics, in terms of bioengineering, all of these will be areas that come up, right? Wherein there is personalized attention given to people. Uh, health becomes a major, major source in terms of understanding all of these things. Yeah. Um, this question what is likely to be the change in? trend in fields related to psychology. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll come back to that question towards the end once we have discussed these things. But yeah, if you're looking at uh, the kind of jobs that we see right now in front of you, uh, for every aspect you could think of in, in, in what way would psychology as a field evolve, right? Um, I mean, at the moment while they're talking, we already have numerous fields of applied psychology. And you're thinking about extending these applications one, in terms of uh, what would be the repercussions of technology onto our lives. So you're looking at a more, um, you know, post hoc kind of an intervention wherein psychologists would come into the play, but also in terms of preparing ourselves for what's happening and then managing things in that sphere, right? To give you an example, I spoke about robotics a while ago, and there is an entire field of applied psychology that looks into social robotics. Right? Social robotics is the field that is into development of social robots. Now, what do we mean by social robots? Uh, you must have seen a couple of videos of robots that have a very human-like face. They communicate emotions. They communicate expressions very similar to human facial expressions. They interact with kids. Um, there could be a lot of educational applications for these. When you're looking at neurodivergent individuals, uh, especially young children trying to get uh, a hold of different socialization skills but aren't very comfortable with humans, they could have a personalized social robot that interacts with them, helps them build their confidence, helps them build their socialization skills. But to develop these robots, you can't just have engineers. You would have to have cognitive psychologists, you would have to have social psychologists, you would have to have developmental psychologists. So all of these expertise in terms of how we apply it to humans right now, there'll be many such applications coming for robotics as well, right? So a lot of applied areas will open up, uh, even in terms of something like psychology, sociology, um, many of the social sciences, languages that we speak about, yeah? Blockchain, crypto, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard many things about it. Some of your peers might already be uh, investing in cryptocurrency. There are discussions about you know, various aspects about it. Um, some of our professors are covering uh, sessions on that as well, right? So cryptocurrency and blockchain are going to be uh, the new buzzword as well. 3D printing is becoming a big, big thing. Uh, we are exploring now with much more diverse materials. It started off with a very limited number of materials, very limited number of designs. We are moving forward to much more complex aspects, right? Now, mining and perhaps somebody uh, spoke about more 
um, green energy, we spoke about uh, power being more sustainable, we spoke about pollution-free roads and traffic. So mining, not just from the perspective of the way we have traditionally been doing that, but probably mining for much more greener resources, uh, power management from a much more cleaner, greener perspective. Right. Space exploration, again, is going to be a major area that's going to take up because, uh, yes, we are running out of space in terms of habitable space on the planet and probably exploration outward is going to begin sometime soon. Quantum mechanics, quantum physics, again, this is going to be one area that's going to pick up. And if anybody's watched um, Interstellar, you'd, you'd quite relate to the final topic, and that's food technology. Right with the advent of um, you know different viruses, with the kind of climate change that we are all facing, uh, it's very likely that some of our produce is not going to remain the same it was. Some of the things that we have been enjoying for all these years uh, might not exactly remain the same. Um, so, what kind of food technology interventions could we have to make sure that there is nutritious food, there is food available to everyone? Um, people have also mentioned about the whole. Uh, issues with poverty, issues with the whole divide between the haves and the have-nots. So from this perspective as well, how do we make food available to all, nutritious food available to all, um, something that is void of insecticides, pesticides, and also something that's quick and nutritious, so that could be a major area that also picks up pace. Yeah. So these are certain areas that uh, you know, you, you could um, explore in terms of what job markets look like. And this is not a list that I've come up with myself. It's based upon what the industry has been talking about, what different experts have been talking about in terms of their futuristic vision for 2040. Right now, as we're looking at this list uh, in terms of, uh, you know, the different applications and different aspects of moving forward. How could we be ready for this kind of a job setup and what kind of skills would we need? Because, uh, you know, there has always been a very negative sentiment that comes with the entire aspect of automation and digitization of everything around us. Right. So uh, if you are looking at some of the news related to what kind of job markets or what would the scenario be in a country like India, wherein we are majorly driven by a lot of workforce. In fact, by um, by 2040 or even earlier, we're looking at a workforce that would be ready to get into the workforce of about 1.1 billion. So what do we do with these individuals if a majority of those jobs are taken over by robots, are taken over by artificial intelligence? Okay, So that seems to be a major uh, issue, not just in the Indian context, but in general, when we're talking about um, the East Asian context, uh, Southeast Asian context specifically, where there is a lot of um, working population that will be entering the workforce. How do we deal with this kind of threat related to automation? Right. So some of the key skills that have been identified that would be necessary to survive, to have a sustainable job, to have a livelihood in 2040 when the metaverse is all around us is going to be firstly that of data and digital literacy, right? Now, what do we mean by data literacy? Data literacy is the, the ability to make sense of data that's around you, to be able to collect data more effectively that's around you, analyze that data, interpret that data, and make use of it for whatever work you're doing, right? So there is so much data around us these days. We talk about different kind of big data analytics. We talk about business analytics. That's obviously from a very specific perspective. But going forward, every field, even um, you know the, the least tech savvy field that you can think of at the moment today, 10 years down the line, 20 years down the line, every field is going to require a lot of emphasis on data, making sense of data that's going to be available. Right. So if you are scared of numbers, and uh, I know a lot of students, especially students getting into the field of arts, uh, when they see numbers, something something happens, right? Uh, and I'm sure uh, that there's going to be that that slight smile on the faces when we talk about statistics and maths, and there's there's some uh, aversiveness to that, right? But moving forward, 
we can't be shy of looking at data. We can't be averse of data entirely. Yes, some of us will be more comfortable. Some of us will be less comfortable when it comes to data, statistics, mathematics, and all of these fields. But going forward, data is going to be something that's going to be very crucial. So how could we get accustomed to it? How could we build our openness towards it? If there are any reservations, if there are any restrictions, any kind of personal biases against it or fears about it, how do we get over those? Because going forward, data is going to be crucial. Right. So it's not necessary that you are a mathematician, you're a statistician, you get uh, into the field of CS or programming only to understand data or those are the only areas where people would be dealing with data. You don't have to be a data scientist. You don't have to be a computer science expert. You don't have to be a programmer or a game developer. For you as an educator, for you as a counselor, for you as a student of even literature or architecture, there would be a lot of data that's going to be available. And how do you make sense of that data is going to decide whether you're going to succeed in a field or not. Right. So that's going to be one major skill. The second is going to be about digital literacy. We all have probably some or the other version of a course for digital literacy in our schools and our colleges. Uh, well, um, Gen Z here would agree that they are also called as digital natives, right? Because you were born in an environment wherein there is data all around you. There are digital gadgets all around you. There's the internet that's working at a speed that probably our generation didn't, uh, wasn't fortunate enough to have, right? But at the same point of time, how many of y'all are actually conversant with these technologies? How many of y'all are sure about the threats that are also involved in it, the ethics that are involved in it, right? So it's not just about being able to use a gadget, but to be able to use it safely, to be able to use it to the best of its potential, and to make sure that it's uh, the most effective way of using the gadget and digital technology around it. Right. So these are going to be certain skills that are going to be extremely, extremely important for us. The second thing is curation. Now, this might sound a little odd compared to the whole tech savvy slide that we saw earlier, wherein there is a lot of uh, gadgets that we are talking about and how are we talking about curation. Think about Netflix, think about your, um, you know, restaurant experiences, think about your food apps, think about your courses, for example. I mean, anybody who is uh, familiar with liberal education, the way we offer, there is a lot of customization of the experience towards the end of you as a user, right? So as a student, you will be curating your entire academic journey in terms of trying to have different combinations of courses. As a consumer, you are looking for a customized curated list of, you know, what movies I would like to watch. And the platform just gives you recommendations based on your history of your viewing. Right? If you're looking at a restaurant experience, you would expect that based upon your earlier orders, the, the app, the platform is suggesting you places, suggesting you a uh, different kind of uh, cuisines and uh, restaurants that suit your taste right so curation as a consumer is what we are already involved in but moving forward as an employee as an employer as an entrepreneur in general you would have to be good at curating things that are around you so that you reach out to your audience be it students be it um, customers be it um, you know any kind of service that you're offering or you're working in um, a typical traditional work set up, you would have to develop your skill of curating the data because there's going to be a lot of data. How do you curate that data and find the most relevant, the most necessary components of it is going to be the major skill needed, right? Storytelling, again, I'm sure some of you all must be wondering how could this be a skill, uh, especially when we're talking about 2040. Right. Uh, just think about your own classroom experiences, especially during COVID when things were online. What was your attention span like? Okay, let's let's be honest. Yeah, what have our attention spans come to? Hours, minutes, seconds, very less. Okay, could you quantify that for me, Shreya, please? Hold fist attention span. Okay. It's okay if you if you don't wish to um, you know 
agree to this on a public platform we could probably just think about it in our own minds right so yes definitely um it, it's reduced a lot um barely a few minutes right probably um some of you are even tempted to open up a new tab and you know watch something or you know responding to whatsapp emails while the session is also going on right so in terms of our attention spans reducing it does not matter which profession you're entering into you will have to be engaging in the way you communicate right it could be communication with your superiors it could be communication with the audience if you're in the field of digital marketing how do you communicate to the audience and grab their attention if you're in the field of creativity how do you grab the attention of the audience right and storytelling is something that comes somewhat naturally in some sense uh, to people that are digital native right so when i'm talking to you all as gen z you're creating reels you're creating different material you're creating different uh, aspects on social media platforms right uh, we have moved from 10 minute videos to 5 minute videos to 30 second videos right that's where we talk about that attention span but how do you communicate that same emotion that same sentiment in that short duration of time right so storytelling is also going to be one way in which you connect with the audience you connect with your clients you connect with job markets everywhere it's going to be a very very crucial aspect right now obviously because the borders are going to almost uh, be you know very virtual in that sense and we will probably be working in virtual teams spread across the globe across different time zones there will be a lot of expectation that you are comfortable working with individuals across the globe you are aware of different cultures or different differences when it comes to working with people across the globe okay now what do we mean by this um, you have to be sensitive one definitely you have to be sensitive to different cultures you have to be sensitive to the needs and expectations of people working in different uh, cultures but along with that you also need to come up with competencies and skills that are expected differently by different cultures right uh, we we can't remain in that phase that okay you know if somebody calls me at 7 i'll probably go at 7:15 because that's indian standard time or what 7:30 and that person won't mind that that person won't mind uh, we, we we can't be in that phase anymore right this is just one of the competency in terms of time management but in general punctuality time management being sensitive to different cultures being sensitive to individuals hailing from different regions different races different regions different languages different gender identities all of this is going to be very very crucial right so global competence not just uh, in the sense of the skills that you have but also in terms of your ideology um, the prejudices and biases that you hold all of these will have to change over a period of time right and finally ethics right this is something that has been uh, you know pointed out time and again while the entire emphasis of development of the metaverse has been in terms of technology internet speeds augmented reality virtual real uh, virtual reality and creating virtual worlds and spaces at the end of the day because there is going to be so much given take of information there is going to be so much data that's going to be created there is going to be so much collaboration across the globe that's going to happen we cannot live without ethics right ethics is going to be the underlining aspect that is going to hold this entire experience together otherwise it would just be a sham it would be very similar to any of those typical sci-fi movies i've seen wherein it's a very futuristic world but it is very gloomy right um uh, it's it's something that has no values um like you've rightly mentioned you know probably poverty is something that becomes the highlight the gap between the rich and the poor becomes the highlight so if all of this has to be avoided ethics is going to be really really crucial right and yes we we will talk about how ethics should be crucial at a more global level where there should be some kind of rules and restrictions and guidelines about using metaverse but also at a very personal level ethics is going to be crucial okay psychological challenges uh because we are looking at the experience we had during covid it was just two years and uh, you know the kind of experiences we had when we went offline and then back online then in hybrid mode all of those changes had a huge toll on our mental health right um, so it's predicted that mental health especially among children is one of the major major concern 
even in 2040, right? Depression, anxiety, uh, substances and addictions of different natures, uh, the entire experience of loneliness because you're in a virtual world, you're spending more time in a virtual world. And probably also the kind of comparison with if I have five avatars on you know, some platform, uh, how many of them are real reflections of who I am and how many of them are completely opposite to who I really am, right? If you've watched uh, movies like Re Ready Player One uh, by Steven Spielberg, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So this gap between the real and the virtual self and that conflict that comes with that also is going to be a major, major psychological concern, right? So now coming back, you know, back, back to reality, back to 2023, back to the session, back to wherever you all are. And, you know, suddenly some of you all might feel a sign of relief that, okay, we are finally back to a known space. You know, things seem familiar. There are gadgets, but not to an extent where we feel lost, right? Now, imagine of this scenario at you know, that you're facing right now. How do we get ready for the metaverse? I have a short clip from uh, the movie Top Gun Maverick. I'm sure some of you all must have watched it. Watched it for Tom Cruise, if not for that, for the planes, if not for that, just because it's a wonderful movie, whatever, right? So this is a small clip from the movie, which will kind of, which kind of conveys what I'm uh, going to hint at in terms of how should we be ready for the metaverse. Okay. F-18 NATOMS contains everything they want you to know about your aircraft. I'm assuming you know the book inside and out. Damn right. Yeah, I'm straight. You got it. So does your enemy. I'm Earl. But what the enemy doesn't know is your limits. Okay. So yes, what does the film help us understand? Um, what do we know about the metaverse? We know where it's leading to. We know where it's heading to. We know what kind of jobs will be uh, prevalent. We know what kind of technology will be prevalent. Uh, if there are some individuals in the audience who consider AI to be a very, very pessimistic phase, uh, probably, uh, you know, Robots will take over the world. We will have that same kind of discussion that happens in most of the sci-fi films. If you're looking at it from that perspective, we cannot stop that development. We cannot stop at the rate at which AI is going, or we cannot decide the direction which it's going. What we can, however, do is build self-awareness. Your skills, your personality, your development, your mental health is predominantly going to be in your hands. Right. So while you can't shape the world in terms of how metaverse is, there'll be too many forces out there. What you could be more interested in and what is it that's there in your hand and what you can be more optimistic about is developing self-awareness. By self-awareness, it's not just on a very philosophical scale, on a very tangible practical scale as well. What are my skills? What are my weaknesses? Um, in the entire list of jobs that we looked at, in the entire list of skills that we looked at, what are the skills that I already possess? What are the skills that I can polish and make them better? What are the skills that I lack? And how should I build uh, those skills? How should I develop those skills? So that's the kind of self-awareness that we're talking about, right? We spoke about different series and different variety of mental health issues that are going to come up. Emotional regulation is going to be a key to resolving all of these. Right. So how do you delay your gratification? How are you okay with when things don't go fine? You know, if, if the internet is off, we, we get very restless. All of these are signs of how technology is ruining our emotional regulation. Are we able to delay our gratification? Are we able to control our impulses? Are we okay when things don't go fine? This is what communicates about our emotional regulation. Right. Uh, we can't just become very snappy. We can't just become very easily irritated and frustrated. We can't just become easily very upset and angry. So we'll have to develop a lot of emotional regulation because there'll be fewer ways in which human connection is going to be possible. Right. There'll be a lot of virtual work. Where are you going to vent out all of this? Where are you going to have catharsis for all of it? So it will have to be more an, of an inward journey wherein you realize you're more self-aware and you're also able to regulate your emotion. 
So developing emotional intelligence skills are going to be really, really crucial aspects of being ready for it. And finally, if you wish to connect, if you wish to be a good storyteller, if you wish to be, uh, you know, reaching out to your audience, reaching out to different people in 2040 in the metaverse, you obviously need a lot of empathy. You need to have different perspectives, right? Even when you're dealing with something as simple as being a data analyst or a business analyst, how do you make sense of that data? How do you communicate that data? What data will make sense to my customers? You need to have that sort of perspective of other people. You need to have that sort of empathy for other people, right? The ethics that we spoke about, the global connect that we spoke about, the key to that is going to be in your interpersonal aspect of empathy, right? There'll be too many individuals to select in a job front. There'll be too many of them greatly qualified in terms of their paperwork, in terms of the degrees that they hold, in terms of the skills that they have. What will differentiate you from any other employee, from any other person is going to be your people skills, right? So empathy is going to be the third key aspect that we're going to need. Okay, that's it from my side. Um, we have about 10 minutes left for questions and answers and suggestions and solutions. If you have found out some way of, you know, probably uh, dealing with all of this, if you have already started preparing for uh, what lies in the future, that, that would be great to discuss. And you know, if you could have those discussions going on. Yeah, I'll just open the chat to see if um, there is something we could take up. Anybody who has any questions, please put them in the Q&A session and they will be answered. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, one thing that we need to remember, I, I see some questions specifically about jobs, about careers. Uh, you know, we have somehow uh, been constantly bombarded with this idea that, okay, what is the field of engineering going to look like? What is the field of psychology going to look like? What is the field of medicine going to look like? Going forward, we are going to look at a very interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary perspective. You can't say that I am a social scientist and that's it. You can't say that I am an engineer and that's it. You can't say that I'm a programmer, but I don't know anything about politics. I don't know anything about sports. Right? We will have to evolve ourselves in such a way that we have multidisciplinary perspective and interdisciplinary knowledge because no field is going to remain pure in its own way. So when you say that I'm an engineer and what kind of professions would there be like if I don't like tech, right? Or if I don't have the mathematical skills that are there, there will be a lot of AI solutions to help you with it. In fact, there are uh, AI is already developing its own uh, programs as well. Right? They are developing algorithms on their own. They are building small programs on their own. So it's okay if you are not great at programming. There would be assistance coming from AI. But the questions that come are going to be coming from humans. Right? There could be help that you get. There will be assistance that you get from AI. There will be help available in the metaverse. You can connect with people across the globe um, and get help for some of the aspects that you're struggling with. But individually, what is it that you want is what is going to be the primary aim, right? So that is something that uh, we need to focus on. Okay, Professor, um, the next question is, every major change in environment has resulted in a simultaneous change in human psychology and perception. How do you think metaverse and its growth is going to affect human psychology as a whole and perception? Right. So like we discussed, there is going to be, um, you know, some of the major challenges that we might face is in terms of your real self and your ideal self, your virtual self and your real self, because you are having a virtual avatar, right? You, you have a particular portrayal that people know you as on that virtual platform. Uh, but internally, you are someone as well, right? someone probably completely different from what you're portraying on the platform. Also, what is going to happen is that there'll be a lot of comparisons that take place. So when we're looking at the entire change, not just from an environment perspective or a climatic perspective, but even in terms of how these platforms will evolve, the major challenge is going to be that how you maintain your uniqueness, your identity, how do you identify yourself and your identity? How do you maintain that uniqueness along with being uh, you know, up to date with what's happening around you? 
So that is going to be slightly tricky. That balance between the virtual and the real is something that's going to be really tricky. Okay. Um. The next attendee has, of course, appreciated you. Has said it was an ex excellent session. So thank you so much sir, for that. Uh. The question is just wondering if there are resources you would recommend for building emotional regulation. How can schools and families help young people do this? Yes, thank you so much for that. Uh, so when we talk about emotional regulation or when we talk about emotion management, as some people refer to it, uh, a lot of emotional intelligence interventions have started off in schools, in some schools especially, and a lot is being done in that field as well. So when you look at basic things like how do you delay your gratification, how you control your impulses, um, also in terms of emotional literacy, building your emotional literacy. So it's very common, you know, when we um, when we are talking with colleagues, when talking with young students, many of them say that I'm I'm, I'm depressed, right, or I'm I'm frustrated, I'm I'm having an anger outburst. Right? So the terms we use need to be used carefully. Depressed is a very clinical term. Are you actually feeling just upset? Are you just low, or are you feeling depressed? We need to be careful about these terms, and that is slowly what we need to build. So that's called emotional literacy. We should build our vocabulary for emotions. We should know what our emotions actually look like and how they um, you know, express themselves in the outer world. And that will give you a way of controlling it because there's a mind-body connection that is actually existing, which we somehow forget. The moment you have this language, it will help you connect with your body as well. So that mind-body connection will happen once we have that vocabulary. So that's something that we could build in children. Uh, Dealing gratification again, it's, it's very crucial that you help children, you help students, you help people around you understand that things may not always happen the way we want them to happen. So constantly pampering, constantly providing everything to children may only increase their expectations about what's possibly not going to happen in the future. So we need to be adaptable, we need to be open to change, and we need to be accepting that things may not go according to plan. Right. So that's something that will build our emotion regulation. Thank you for that, sir. Um, next, we have uh, Keithy would like to know more options and eligibility in the field of psychology, maybe in separate call or main. Sure, sure. Yeah, just just keep uh, you know an open perspective in terms of psychology or any other field. Like I said, that uh, you're looking at such diverse uh, combinations that will come up that we you know can't even imagine the kind of fields that will emerge there so like i said social robotics is one field um, that you can think of where you're applying psychology to that uh, digital marketing is a field where that will be applied data curation is again something where in psychology could be applied so many fields that come up but yes uh, a separate call is something that we could definitely have to discuss this what do day-to-day activities should we start inculcating in ourselves to develop the skills that Sir talked about in the session? Yeah. So, you know, very ironically, now we have an app for everything. You know, we have an app for our health. We have an app for our sleep management. We have an app for uh, being away from technology. So imagine that you have an app that helps you tell, that, that tells you that, you know, you need to now keep yourself on a way. You, you have spent so many hours on screen. You have spent so many hours typing. You have spent so many hours on YouTube. So why do we need to, again, be so over-dependent upon technology to tell us this? You know, can we go back to a little old school style of doing things? I think that bit wherein you are using technology for your benefit and you do not become dependent upon technology. That's a slight difference that will help us, uh, you know, be ready for the future. Because what is happening is when we talk about metaverse, when we talk about AI, the entire apprehension comes from the fact that these things will take over humans, right? Now, they'll be able to take over humans only if you allow them to, right? It's as simple as that. So when you say that I wish to take time off, you know, any screen time that's there, or I, I need to, you know, detoxify and go away uh, from all gadgets, that should be a personal choice. If you want to use gadgets, that should be a personal choice. If you want to spend time on social media, that should be a personal choice. The moment you start feeling that, you know, I'm, I'm spending more time than I should, or I'm spending more energy than I think I should, or maybe the algorithm is deciding what I'm doing, that's when you're giving in to technology. So I think as a habit, just be very mindful when you're using technology and also be very careful about when do you think that, you know, somebody else is controlling, whether it's the algorithm or, you know, the people designing the software behind it. 
So being mindful when using technology, using it as your way or your assistance and not becoming a slave to technology. That's that's what would be the key word. Um, I think we're done with the questions. If anybody has any more questions, um, I'll give you about two minutes to please type it in the in the Q and A section, and we'll take it out. Assuming that we have no more questions, I think we can end this. Thank you so much to all the participants for taking the day out of your time, uh, the time out of your day, and attending this session. Once again, thank you so much, Professor, for coming and giving us this really enlightening session. Thank you so much, Sila. Thank you to all the participants. Take care. Bless you.